to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of To the Point. With us today, representing Ohio's 12th Congressional District, is Congressman Pat T. Berry. Congressman T. Berry is a graduate of the Ohio State University, worked as a realtor while serving in the Ohio House of Representatives, and eventually became the House Majority Leader. He has been a member of the U.S. House of Representatives since 2001, and I've had the pleasure of serving with him in the House Ways and Means Committee since 2007. I served with Congressman uh, T. Berry on the powerful House and Ways and Means Committee, where he is the current chairman of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Health and Services, and the Subcommittee on Tax Policy. Most important, Congressman T. Berry is a friend. We served together as co-chairs of the Italian-American Congressional Delegation, and he's here with us today to discuss his experience in Congress, his years as a public servant, as this will be his final term as a member of the United States House of Representatives. So, Pat, welcome. Great we're to be here, to, Bill. We're honored to have you. I'm honored, honored to, to be on your you. show. And uh, we, I, 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 I'm thrilled about this. I'm, I'm excited about this because you have been a great friend, a true friend, a man of his word. And not everybody in the Congress keeps their word. On both <laughs> sides a, of the aisle, right? Absolutely. Anywhere keeps Absolutely. their word. So, yeah. so the point of the matter is I'm anxious to talk to you about this experience. I'm, I'm looking, Pat, in your history you, you majored in journalism. I majored in journalism. And I'll tell you the funny, the crazy story. I don't, I don't have know, a TV show like you. I, I, <laughs> I'll tell you this crazy story okay. about when I went out to look for a job uh, in communications and in, in journalism. When I saw what they were paying, I said, I better find something else. <laughs> <laughs> so I wound up teaching, um, much to my parents' uh, chagrin. Uh, they're, they're, they've passed. They've gone to, the, to their maker. They wanted me to be a lawyer. And, and we have similar backgrounds. I was the first one to graduate. You were the first one to graduate high school in your yeah, family. Yeah, right. I was the first one to graduate grammar school in my family. Oh, wow. So I was the great hope in the neighborhood. There's a lot of pressure, Pat. I bet. <laughs> Did your parents have, uh, like, aspirations that this is what they wanted you to be when you grew up? You know, my, my mom and dad both me and I'm the oldest and my sisters, they, they just wanted us to get an education because they believed that an education in America was the great equalizer. Right, right. Neither of them had a formal education in America. They both came over to... The smartest people we ever met, though. That's exactly right. I was just going to say that, Bill. I mean, my, my dad has a sixth grade Italian education and he's the smartest guy I'd, yeah. I've ever God met. God bless him. And what he was able to accomplish, he's a steel worker, yeah. but think about it. What he was able to accomplish, and you have the same story, is he came to America at 16 with nothing, nothing. with his older sister. Didn't know the language, didn't know our culture, didn't know anybody, and he was able to provide for me and my sisters and encourage us to get an education, go to college, get a degree, and with, with, uh, with understanding English and, and that formal education, you could make something of yourself, whatever that might be. Right. Right. When I look back, a lot of the a lot of the guys I hung out with didn't make it. Didn't make it. Period. Uh, education was important, but up just to a point. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know how I made it through high school. I think I know. To go into college, <laughs> <laughs> to, to to make it into college, and uh, I want to be a baseball player. Yeah. Uh, you, you played an instrument in the high school band. You played yeah. a trumpet. I played a trumpet, by the way. And I, and I wanted to be a professional baseball player for the Cincinnati Reds when I grew up. Really? It didn't work out so well. I had two tryouts with the Phillies. I didn't even get that far. <laughs> but, you know, I you know I was young, spitting vinegar. And, uh, well, you're still spitting vinegar. They, they, wanted, they wanted long ball hitters they wanted, <laughs> rather than punch hitters. I was a punch hitter. But we have similar, I'm looking at it it's and I'm saying, funny. God, this is interesting, you know. Yep. I'm older than you are, but we have we have backgrounds that are the same. How did they take that you ran your parents? How did how did they take it when you say I'm going to run? That's one thing to be a, a legislator. I right. was a legislator too. Right. You were the speaker of the house. Majority leader. I was the speaker pro tem. Jeez. So I mean, it's pretty close. Go back. And Unbelievable. Forth. But when you when you were going to run for Congress, they were all in, right? 
Absolutely. So my parents were Democrats. My dad was a steel worker. Yeah. He was a Reagan Democrat. So Reagan was the first. My father was similar. So my dad, uh, first time he voted for a Republican was Ronald Reagan. Right. And so I began, when I was in college, I accidentally got assigned a, an internship, a field political science class that I had with my congressman, whose name was John Kasich. Wow. They love John Kasich. Yeah. He's now our governor of our state. Yes. And John Kasich then hired me. Uh, part-time as I was working my way through college yeah. and that kind of opened my eyes a little bit because I while I was a registered Democrat I really didn't know anything about yeah. politics or, or government but I, I liked Reagan uh, first person I voted for in 1984 was Ronald Reagan so you know interesting uh, background but my parents um, while they were Democrats I would say they were conservative Democrats right, right. Uh, so were mine. like like many in the Italian community in, in Central Ohio right. uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the members of the Italian community were entrepreneurs, yeah. and, and so um, it wasn't um, it wasn't shocking to them. But they did change and become Republicans when I had a primary when I ran for Congress, and they became Republicans. Wow! Yeah. So I had to vote for you in the primary. Right. Well, isn't that fascinating? And I won the primary. That is a fascinating mm -hmm. kind of thing. My father w voted more Republican than Democrat. Wow. And then, of course, when I became a congressman, he felt obligated. <laughs> that's probably why. That's the only reason. But uh, he was proud of me, my dad and my and my mother. He lived to see me get sworn in. That's awesome. And he didn't die too long after that. And it was a great time we had down I'm here sure. in Washington. We held up dry four buses down from New Jersey. Remember that those days when you got sworn in the, the first yes. time? You brought your family here. We came in buses. Absolutely yeah. right. And, and they were very proud. Off the streets of Columbus. Yep. Here you are. And I was a kid off the street of Patterson, New Jersey. Right. And now, look what you did. You, 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 you rose. You became a chairman of a couple of subcommittees. That's a terrific history, Pat. Yeah. Is that your best time in the Congress when you served on Ways and Means? You know, Ways and Means was an, was an awesome committee. Uh, just coming here that first year right. was you had to pinch yourself. And Whoa. I still often pinch yeah. yourself. But... It was like, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. You'll appreciate this. My uncle from Italy, my mom's youngest brother, uh, said to me when he came here, he said, you have no idea what a big deal this is. Because in Italy, even in Italy still, it yeah. depends what family you're from. And we're not from the right family. <laughs> and in America, you, somebody like you yeah. can get elected to Believe the Congress, it or not. right? <laughs> right? And he mentioned sure. Bill Clinton getting, yeah. you know, getting to become oh, yeah. president. That's yeah. a big deal from, from his background. All the way from hope. Oh, only in America. <laughs> That's right. Only in America. What's the most exciting time you had in the Congress of the, all the 16, 17 years? You know, there, there are so many things to point to, Bill, but you know, one of the things that you and I have had the ability to share together, and you mentioned it at, at the beginning, is being co-chairman of the Italian-American right. Caucus yeah. and having a shared heritage and putting our, our partisan labels aside and our and our R's and D's aside, and celebrating the alliance between a very important ally of ours, Italy, and, and America, and getting to know people on a more personal level that share that common heritage. And I think that is so important, and quite frankly, lacking in Washington, D.C. today. Not just in the House, but all over Washington, D.C. I today. agree. And in our country. Yeah. And you know, back in the good old days, uh, there was a lot more of that, and a lot more things got done. Yeah. I. I am not too big on identity politics. I think it gets you in a lot of trouble. I'm sometimes. not either. I'm not either. And I, you know, I judge everybody equally. Everybody's born equal. It doesn't matter uh, what country you're born in. Agreed, 100. Uh, you can 100%. be born in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Uh, if they have no constitution, you're still absolutely right. God-given rights, and the Constitution protects them. Absolutely. But to share our common heritage, That's you know, the history of That's where our, our, uh, our forefathers came from, and the alliance, which is important strategically, right. uh, between Europe and, and Italy, and Italy and the United States is very important too. And that's some of the things we got to do more so than we would have if yeah. we hadn't been part of that. Before we got here, yeah, uh, this place was a lot more friendly. Absolutely. I, I read about it, I hear about it from folks who've been here a real long time. And I don't know... You don't have you don't have to, but I would want yeah. you to respond to what I'm going to say about. Mm -hmm. I noticed the big change happening before I got here in the early '90s, uh, when Newt Gingrich ran. Worked very hard for that position. I read his books. Right. 
and how he got to this point, what he studied, uh, uh, and, and followed very, very carefully. And he took over uh, at an interesting time in the early 90s, 94, the Gingrich Rev Rev Revolution. But I remember him saying something which really angered me. You know, in our business, you better not get angry <laughs> because you'll stay angry. Yeah. You know, you got to you right. got to deal with it maturely. Right. He said at that time when he took over, now the Democrats are irrelevant. And in 96, when I ran and got elected, I, I beat an incumbent and Clinton ran that year for the, for the second time. Yep. And won. After Clinton won, they still, we, we had a Democratic president again, and we had Republicans. And, and he said, you're irrelevant. Then I saw him go back down Pennsylvania Avenue to make a deal a couple of times. And those guys worked out something where we balanced the budget for two or three years. But something changed. Maybe part of our heart changed. I don't know if you noticed, because you didn't get there to 2001. Right. And when you got here... What was, what, what was your observations? Well, it was certainly less um, nonpartisan than the, the state house was in the legislature in Ohio where I had come from. Uh, but, you know, I look back now over the last 17 years, and, and you're right, but it's gotten worse. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't great, but it's mm. progressively gotten right. worse. And it's gotten worse in Ohio, too, by the way. And yes. I think we're kind of a reflection of society. You know, people have gotten much um, less polite in talking to elected officials. Right. I'm sure you see it as well. Yeah. Whether they be Republicans or Democrats, by the way. You know, I'm not conservative enough. I'm too liberal. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's Names. all... Names. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's yeah. all over the political spectrum, and people have lost their manners. I think social media has made it worse. Oh, yeah, I like that. Social media is great. Yeah. Uh, Technology is wonderful, but it's also used in, in ways that yeah. uh, make people a lot you know, a lot less polite. Yeah, and the and people don't have a time to be with their private thoughts. That's right. Because the, you're on, you're flashed there and you're flashed there. That's exactly you're right. You always got to be on. Oh, really? That's exactly right, Bill. But, you know, sometimes... That's the big difference. And I think that is a big difference. I think that is a very, very big difference. Respecting one another. You know, I could be very vociferous when I get into a debate, et cetera, et cetera. I've always tried to be respectful of the other person, give right. the other person the benefit of the doubt. But some people have come here to be simply in a pedantic debate. 100% agree with you. <laughs> and sometimes people misread because of where we are today. If you, if you raise your voice or get emotional, they, they don't hear what you're saying, yeah. but they see the emotion and they think that, that you're being rude. That's correct. And I think, I think that happens more often today as well. To your point, because I, I, I think you are not. Uh, one of those those folks. And try but, not to. But be. when you get when you get emotional, you are pretty emotional. Yes. Probably, probably part of the heritage. Part of the heritage. <laughs> and, and, and but but uh, you know you are somebody, Bill, and and I believe this, and I know a number of my colleagues agree with that. You're a guy who wants to make the trains work on time, right. and is willing to give, and wants to govern, and respects somebody. Even if their opinion is differently, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm yeah. living proof yeah. of that because we've disagreed on things, absolutely. But we do in a disagreeable, in, in a and disagreeable. I, I said to you a couple of years ago, I remember saying at the meeting, "Well, look, if T. Barry and Pascal were in the room, yes. we'll come out with a resolve. We'll we'll resolve the problems. Yep, all of us should be able to think that way. Absolutely right. And I meant it. And it's missing today. It is. It's missing today, particularly from the higher levels of, of government yeah. and the leadership in both parties, quite right. frankly. And until we get uh, um, uh, a president, uh, you know, a speaker, a uh, Senate majority leader, both parties who's willing to put that yeah. aside and work with the other side like our founders intended, this is going to be a tough slog. Yeah. I, we don't want to end the age of controversy. But the question is, in conflict, you must respect the other person. Correct. In the other person's position. Correct. If it's the other person's position, and that we don't become sycophants to our party, we don't simply become followers. Absolutely. How did you make that? How did you uh, do that balancing act between party and own your own independent conscience? 
because you do have it. You've demonstrated it. Yeah. Not only in the bills that you put forth, but how you debate, how you discuss issues. Yeah, well, you know what? You you have to be willing to lose an election. I had a primary in 2010 or 2012, I think it was, uh, when I uh, had an we opponent. We had it both at the same time. I when think, I had an opponent primaries. who called me uh, a lap, uh, an Obama lapdog, <laughs> right, in a Republican primary. So he was to the right of Charlemagne, yes, probably. Yeah. And so I beat him 80-20. So you have to have confidence in the fact that, right. you know what, you got to do what's important for country first. Uh, and I have a philosophy. My philosophy is more conservative than yours. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, I know that we don't live in a dictatorship. We right. live in a republic. And right. you have to compromise at the end of the day. And you right. have to, you have to uh, you know, weigh both sides of it and, and try to work with the other side as best you can. And sometimes the other side's to my right, <laughs> not just to my left. <laughs> uh, an example of that is how we started off this, the, the year of 2017. <clears throat> I'm of the belief in the minority party, we Democrats are in the minority, that if the president started off in trying to deal with a subject that we might get some agreement on, uh, not all, but some, uh, he, he would have been better off, the country would have been better off. I thought the wrong subject was health care. It, it, it's personal to everybody. It's personal. We got beat up. Remember in 2010? I do. We got the I hell remember. knocked out of us. I, mean, I remember. In, in, in forums out there, uh, you know, public meetings, town meetings. But if you can't stand the heat, as Harry Truman said, get out of the kitchen. But there was a perfect example. Now, why did he think that that was the way to get through to common ground? Or maybe he never hoped to get common ground. I thought it was no, no. The, wor the worst subject. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, well, it's always easy to be an armchair quarterback. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but yeah, you, yes, you're absolutely right. Infrastructure probably would have been the the uh, the best big issue to kind of kick it off and try to get some bipartisanship right, here. Right. And and the president had, you know, he quite frankly had the chops to do that on infrastructure and to get Democrat support based upon his history of it supporting Democrats. And infrastructure was a, was a big deal to him. So I don't know. Why they they chose health care? They certainly aren't going to listen to me, and still not going to listen to me. We did the same thing. You did in twenty two thousand nine. In two thousand nine, when did. we started off that year. Yep. Before the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, we started off talking about the, uh, the carbon. Yep. <laughs> cap and trade. And and they cap and trade, and the and the Senate said they weren't going to bring it up. No, oh, I remember that. And a couple, you know, a couple guys in the Midwest aren't here because of that. That's correct. In the House. That is absolutely Democrats. correct. So you lay the foundation, and move on to yeah. the tougher things. That's history, what I would. Have. History tends to repeat itself, doesn't it? It really does. <laughs> it really does, regardless of which party you're in. It's absolutely. What's the toughest subject you had to face? since you've been in the Congress in the 17 years you've been here? You know, the most emotional one, uh, I mean, there, there have been, I would put two out there equally, because they were, they were gut-wrenching emotional. And, and one was the, uh, the decision on Iraq, quite frankly. And I think we were opposite sides of that. That was, that was I hard. I voted for yes. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't realize that. I didn't look at that. I, I, I made were, up my mind that morning, after I had read the New Yorker magazine, I found Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein that's exactly had right. used chemical yes. weapons. Yes. That was the second time I read about that, and that pushed me over the top. In my district up in North Jersey, it's 80 to 1 to vote no. I voted yes. So I said we only had one president at the time. And then six months later when I apologized to my constituents, I said I made a big mistake. I didn't blame Bush. I said I made the mistake, Yeah. not Bush. So, I'm a grown adult. <laughs> you were, and you remember that. That was a. T I mean, that was hard. Ooh. And the other one that's hard that was hard. And you might remember this too. It was that week. Um, I voted no the first time, and then I voted yes the second time. After some of us Democrats and Republicans got the speaker to change the bill a little bit, it was when the the, the market crashed oh, yeah. during the 2008 campaign. I remember that like it and happened yesterday. I remember we were on the floor and we were getting calls. Paulson from, Paulson comes in. Yes. Right. With the crumpled up paper. Yeah. This is the end of the world. That's exactly. You guys got to act now. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, I wasn't convinced. And I would have Trump down. I would have President Trump handled. He said he handled all oh, what a mess I got when I became the president. How? What if you were the president? In those circumstances, what would you Pretty have done? Pretty tough time. When, 
when there's no investment from the corporate America and there's no money out there. So what do you do in that particular position? You spend money in order to get this economy moving again. It's not the answer, we, no, I mean, but you got to do it. It's a series of bad choices. There's no good choice. But when right. you have people calling you saying, uh, you know, university saying, I can't meet payroll I because know. I can't get credit because the credit's frozen. You, ha you have a bank president say, I this 85-year-old widow who just took out in cash $115,000 yeah. yeah. to put under her mattress because yeah. she's afraid she's going to lose it all, yeah. even though we know she wouldn't. There goes because the bank's of, revenue. Exactly right. <laughs> But, but these are the decisions that you have to make. Right. What, what, what do you think you'll remember most about the Congress? Now, you're going to be here another year. So I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, put you, push you aside. You're going to be a very... I'm not going to be here that long. You're going to be active. But I'm not going to be that You're going to be here a little while. So anyway. remember when I came in, 2001. Yeah. I remember September 11th, which oh, is, yeah. you know, all of us do. I mean, especially your constituents in, in New Jersey and, and New York, oh my goodness, and here in, in, uh, in D.C. and in Northern you. Virginia, oh my goodness, what a horrific thing that you'd never believe that you would see in your lifetime. Never. Uh, you were thinking you were in the middle of a movie almost, Or a dream. Right? Or a dream nightmare. or a nightmare. Um, I mean, that, that, that is unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, um, they're, just the mere fact that a kid son of immigrants could actually walk the halls of Congress and, and try to make good and, and not, worry about, not worry about getting credit for it and working with uh, people like you and others to, to um, you know, make uh, life a little bit better for everybody else. I was fortunate to go to the pile uh, with the president. Uh, there was several of the congressmen went up there. I thought it was a, I thought it was a nightmare. I, thought, I, said, I said to myself, as we're landing in Long Island, we saw the smoke storm, we, and we're, dr we're taking a bus to, to the pile, and I couldn't believe this. I said, this has got to be a dream. It cannot right. happen this way, it cannot. And I remember President Bush that day getting people together, and I'll remember what he said that night. We cannot blame the Muslim community. Right. He's these right. Are, these are crazy people that did this. Right. And and let's not take it out on it. Right. What a what a spiritual thing to say. Yep. I mean, I didn't vote for the guy. Leadership at, That's a, at, a, real, at a real real critical real time. leadership at a critical real time. leadership does not pile on or divide. Does not, or divide, and 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 folks that are watching us and listening to us right now, right. you don't have to tell them what you're talking about, and I don't have to tell them what I'm talking about. They right. get the picture, and it's clear as day. It's clear as day, Patrick. It's back to what you talked about earlier, Bill. It's identity politics, and Republicans use it, and Democrats use it. You don't use it. I don't use it, and we got to really work hard to try to get more of our colleagues not to do it because we're elected yeah. to try to not divide but to unite. Yeah, and I, th I think, in my own opinion, I mean, you probably don't agree with me, that this tax thing that we just have gone through and are still going through, uh, and we're, we're filming this on Pearl Harbor Day, very <laughs> apropos, uh, could have been done different. And I always thought that we, sh we should have been in, in it in the beginning. I, I don't disagree and with I that. And I think we would have come out with something. I, I don't disagree with that. And by the way, you know, I, I'm not the chairman, so I, I, didn't, I didn't have I the, wish you had. I didn't have the, uh, uh, the choice. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, we, we got to get back to that. We got to get yeah. back to where the committees... Of jurisdiction actually get to be involved in the hundred percent of and writing the bill. Leadership doesn't dictate whether to those they're Democrat chairman. or Republican leaders. Absolutely right, yeah. and that members of the committees can work together and get things done. And you know, on smaller things, I mean, on smaller things, uh, we've gotten some stuff done. Uh, we've gotten. I mean, I'm thinking of, of some of the health care things I've done with Sandy Levin, a and your liberal bill, Democrat in uh, in Michigan. You got one of the great bills. Mark new markets. Yes, new markets. Talk about that for you. Yeah, so I've got. I mean, innovation. This uh, innovation in uh, Opportunity Act is patterned after the new market tax credit, which is about in, in encouraging investment, private investment in, in How communities. How can you be against that? In communities. Uh, human capital. Human capital in communities in Patterson or in Columbus yeah. that are distressed, yes. as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau, and trying to to get more targeted dollars into those communities yeah. to try to revitalize those communities and give people opportunity yes. in those communities. And I think we're going to get there. I hope you're right. I really do. 
Uh, what are you going to miss most? People like you. Oh, gee. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about, I'm not going to miss the circus, but I'll miss the clowns. How about, you get that what I mean? I'll, I'll, accept, <laughs> I'll, I'll accept the job as a clown. I, I will miss the people here. They're, despite the headlines in, in your constituency and my constituency, we had a, a, another elected official resign today. There, there might be another one resign next week. Yeah, I know. Despite that, you know, we're a reflection of society. Most members that I know here, Democrats and Republicans, most, not all, are good people and right. are here for the right reasons. And you know what, Pat? We're going to miss you. Thank you. We're going to miss you because of who you are and what your parents made. Yeah. And they knew what they were doing. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, God bless Columbus, Thank you. your whole district. You live outside of Columbus a little bit now, right? Yep, live in the suburbs. What's, yep. What town? It's Galena. Galena, very good. And your beautiful children. Thank you. And wife. You got it made. Thank you. And I, I know you'll be successful regardless of what you do. I appreciate that, Bill. You are. I will miss you. You are a success. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you for watching this edition to The Point. I'd like to thank my guest, Pat Tiberi. Uh, you've heard our thoughts. Now I'd like to hear what you think about today's show. If you have any comments, concerns, questions, stay tuned. The address, phone number, website address will appear in a moment. Thanks again for tuning in. See you next time on To The Point. Take care. took was someone who would insist that I just try. Suddenly everything was turned around because they judge you. You tell them, I don't need this. No one is going to understand. Unless they've been through it, how can they? Then one day you realize, you feel so hopeless. I need help. I need help. You feel so hopeless. Then one day you realize... Unless they've been through it, how can they understand? I don't need this. No one's going to judge you. Suddenly everything was turned around because they insist that I just try. All it took was someone who would just... Listen. After leaving the military, some veterans may face homelessness, but they aren't alone in the battle. Thanks to a simple phone call, they can get help from a trained professional at VA. If you know of or are a veteran in need, call 877-424-3838.